afternoon, everyone. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for your patience. We're so excited for this conversation today. My name is Erite Weiler, and I am the Chief Operating Officer of The Atlantic Magazine. We're so excited to be here. Um, today, we're going to have a conversation with our culture editor, Lauren Williams, and the wonderful Dee Reese, who uh, was a Sundance Institute Vanguard Award winner and uh, the first black woman to be nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay by the, Acad the Academy Awards in 2017 for Mudbound. Um, so she is returning to Sundance this year with a highly anticipated feature film, The Last Thing He Wanted. Uh, it's adopted by, uh, from a novel by Joan Didion, and it features Anne Hathaway as a veteran journalist who goes from being the writer of a story to the subject of the story. Um, so uh, I think one reason that we are so excited to be a sponsor of the Sundance Film Festival this year is because film has the power to enlighten, inform, and even challenge the national discourse through storytelling. And that's exactly what The Atlantic has been doing for our readers for 162 years. Um, we're so grateful to be here. We're so grateful to the Sundance Institute. We're so grateful to Canada Goose for hosting us in this space. And uh, without further ado, I'd love to introduce um, Lauren Williams from The Atlantic. And Dee Reese. Thank you all. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Dee, for being here. Let's, uh, let's jump right in. So the last thing he wanted. What was the motivation behind you choosing this particular Didion novel? Yeah, so I read this novel maybe first like six years ago, and the thing I loved about it was the kind of father-daughter love story at the center. And so to me, I wanted to explore this idea of like cycles and things we do for our fathers and like this idea of like guilt. And, and for me, like these characters, like Elena is like repeating a cycle that she's desperately trying to avoid. So her father, there's like neglect and abandonment. And um, you know she's determined not to be that, but there's some of that repetition with her daughter. And also, like on a bigger scope, it's about U.S. imperialism, you know. But then through the lens of this one particular kind of like, um, yeah, story. So yeah, um, adaptations are notoriously hard to do, right? Because you want to exert your creative force, but you also want to stay true to the text. So how did you sort of strike that balance when you were writing the screenplay? Yeah, so first of all, um, I hired this guy, Marco Villalobos, who's an amazing writer, he's a poet, and so I'd read his like work before, and so I knew that he'd be the perfect person to st start like taking it on. And the idea was not to like um, get in the way of Didion's prose, it has such a propulsion and such a like clinical feeling, and so like the screenplay needed to like have that kind of vibe. And so basically it was about, and if you read the book structurally, it's like, it's, rep it's repetitious, it's told from the point of view of a narrator who we don't even know who's telling the story, and it's also like fragmented. And so I think the most challenging thing was how to like take that kind of fragmentary narrative from an unknown narrator and try to like s create characters that help like cite the, 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 the arc of it. So for example, so Marco added a character named Alma who like is not in the book, and Alma, you know, acts as like this kind of like, um, um, kind of like, seeing force and she's like a grounding and she's like you know her backstory for, for Rosie was that like it's taken her maybe 30 years to get to the same job that like Elena has gotten and so she's able to see things in a grounded way in like a non-panicked way that Elena can't see and then Jones was like an addition Jones in the book is maybe like one sentence and so Jones was a character and so my idea was to make him into well, I'll give it away, but the idea was to make him into this unexpected kind of um, actor in the story, and it really starts to make you question, like, who do you think is the hero, who's the villain, and then, you know, getting the subtle kind of ideas about race, and, like, Elena's blind spot is the thing that ultimately is, is her downfall, so um, it's, like, inserting characters that kind of gave it a different kind of tra trajectory and kind of, like, contextualized, like, the main character, so... Right. So when you and Mark were working on the screenplay, did you have specific actors in mind? I'm very curious about the casting decisions. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, I just needed somebody like kind of hardened to play Elena, and so Anne Hathaway wasn't like the first person I thought of. <laughs> and um, it's funny, like her, I think her, her agent had seen the script and was like, Anne wants to meet, she's gotta meet with you. I'm like, all right. But um, I just saw her as very sweet and girl next door and like almost she has like a friendly face. I'm like, she can't do this. She's too friendly and sweet looking. And so I met with her and she like, we, it was like we're at the Chateau Marmont and having lunch and she was like going in on why she knew Elena and why she understood this kind of father-daughter kind of like connection. 
And so um, you just want to choose actors that are passionate for it. And for Dick, I wanted a guy, you had to believe that he was like a wheeler dealer in his day. He had to be suave. He had to be like um, attractive, not just in a physical sense, but just like in a charismatic kind of sense. And then for Treat, I wanted someone who looked like a diplomat, someone, and I pulled reference photos of this um, uh, diplomat in the 80s who was like standing behind like Nancy Reagan. So it's like that guy, I need someone who can feel like this all-American, you know, uh, force. And so that kind of, so like Ben Affleck is like all-American, that guy. And then for Jones, um, Eddie Gathegi was perfect because I wanted somebody who was elegant, um, trim, and someone who just has like a certain intelligence, you know, in his eyes and like in his like bearing. And um, so um, Eddie was that. And so that's kind of like the, the gist of it, like Rosie Perez. Again, it's just like somebody who was just like wise and like matter of fact, and someone who you could who you could believe has like paid her dues, paid more than her dues, you know, um, and is an artist. And yeah. so almost like this artist. And so she contrasts Elena in that she has a life outside of this job, you know, and if Elena had that, things might have turned out differently. So yeah. Rosie was my particular fave. Um, so you just listed this heavyweight cast of actors. How do you sort of toe the line between directing and pushing your vision and just sort of letting them do what they do because they're veterans and you know you want to trust them? How do you sort of balance that? Um, I work the same way with all actors, whether they you know are Oscar-winning actors or first-time actors. To me, it's just about I just they're artists and the whole thing is a collaboration. So for me, like I don't do rehearsals where pounding the words in or pounding the script. I trust you're a professional. You're going to show up. You're going to know the script. And for me, I'm just interested in the, in, in, the, in the relationships. So in the same way I did on Mudbound and Pariah, I just did some kind of relationship exercises. And so I had less time on this one because the actors are all doing other things. But the thing was with um, Anne Hathaway and Onada April, who plays her daughter, to just do some, like, you know, touching exercises, you know. So I did a thing where I told the daughter, like, your mom can't touch you until you give her permission kind of thing. And so they had this kind of face-off where Anne had to, like, deal with, like, the guilt of, like, you know, abandoning this child or the distance, like, between them. And then, um, like, on set, it's, like, always let the actor have the first take. Because I feel like you can, like, over-talk it, and then they're trying to do what you said and the thing they prepared. So I think it's always giving them a shot to do what they prepared, and then you make adjustments. And you don't make every adjustment at once. It's like, okay, we got this part. Okay, now what if we change this thing here? So it's like you're adjusting different parts of the text as you go. It's not trying to do all the adjustments all on the next take. So you just, like, slowly kind of, like, reel it in. And, you know, you get a sense for how actors work. Like, some actors are hot and ready, you know, and they're best on take one, and some actors warm up and they're best on take five, so then you you, you kind of shoot it that way, like if I know one person is better, I'll shoot them first, and I'll shoot the other person after they've warmed up, so it's just like you use all those kind of things as you, as you kind of get to read people's styles, and um, and just in like the production process, it's just really keeping stuff out of their way, it's like, you know, I try to block the scene such that they can move, and like the camera is moving with them, and they're not getting around us, and you know, thinking about the film as, as they're working. So craft-wise, because this was an adaptation, did you find that you had to sort of exercise different muscles than you would have if it were sort of your own original screenplay? Like, was there pressure to, to be doing this sort of well-respected writer's work? There wasn't necessarily pressure, I think, you know, because in the same way that Mudbound was an adaptation, I think any, with any adaptation, you have to, like, make it yours, you know? So, like, the author has a POV on the characters, and I think you as a filmmaker have to have, to have like, a POV that is beyond like what's in the page. Right. And so for um, and so for this, it was more just about giving everybody a reason, which was hard because for Elena, there is no why, you know, which is part of like why I like the book, like there's no real clear, why would she do this? Why does she stay? Three different characters ask her, why are you still here? And she never has an answer. And so for her, you know, the one time she tells the truth, she's like, oh, because if I walked away from this, I'd walk away from like everything. It's just kind of like building everything like, like around that one core. And for me, her core was this kind of like um, um, desire not to repeat a cycle, you know, this cycle of like neglect. And in the whole kind of idea of like how it's like she thinks that she's like a very conscious person. She's worked in South America, but she still has this like racial blind spot. So it's also kind of like showing how this person thinks that they know how their peripheral vision like slowly like shuts down and they have like like tunnel vision like like by the end of the story and can't see what's what's kind of obvious. Right. So yeah. do you think that that sort of like racial tunnel vision was apparent in the novel, or do you think that was your sort of take as a reader? So that's like what we added, you know, because we didn't want like, you know, like that's kind of our, that was like our take on it. It's like, yes, white woman thinks she knows everything is going to go and solve the thing and expose the thing and 
you know, doesn't know the half of what she's involved in. So that was part. And like, you know, I love what Marco did in terms of meeting her in Salvador. It's like, you know, we understand why she thinks she knows, why th why she thinks she has like authority. And also, it's, it's yeah, so that was like an addition, and, but to me that's the art of adaptation, like adding in a take, adding in a POV that's not necessarily there that you can like, you know, um, use to kind of make the text and just make the whole kind of characters more complicated, more, more interesting. But I mean, the book, it, the book is a masterpiece, like I love it, so. What other texts did you depend on to help you sort of form the narrative? Like we, the, the film is set um, during the Iran Contra. So w were there like historical texts that you read that sort of gave you context for what was going on during that time? Yeah, so kind of like encyclopedias or like <laughs> encyclopedic texts. And I tried to at one point do a map of like Nicaragua and what was happening when and who took over from whom and you know, then the rebels who became then the, it, it was, and then I realized, okay, we're not gonna be able to explain this. Yeah. So in many the layers. film, <laughs> but let's just try to figure out this character's like connection to it. And so, yeah, there was definitely that kind of like trying to map out who the players were and like Reagan's role in it. And like, and so it, it, it then just became obvious. Okay, we're not going to explain to the audience everything that happened in the Iron Contra scandal. We just need to create like a sense of unease and a sense of our government is lying to us in like a time where people wanted to believe and people like wanted to trust authority. And I think it mirrors now where like now we know authority is corrupt, but here's a time where we still thought things were on the up and up and, and you know, here's this kind of crack of but what if it isn't? And then, you know, the kind of real truth of like who knows that and who thinks they know that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then um I jo um I also read Didion's other essays because she wrote a lot about the time. Because even though this is fiction, it feels like a lived experience. And so she wrote an essay on on Salvador. And so using that and using her other journalistic, you know, kind of like writings of the time were like informing kind of like the milieu and the setting of it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a bit about the cinematography and the decisions that you made creatively um, with the shots and sort of the overall mood of this. Because it was it was a beautiful. There there are these like gorgeous beach scenes and it's it's such a juxtaposition towards like what's actually going on in the plot. Um, so talk a bit about the, the camera work and, and the decisions you made there. Yeah, yeah. so Bobby Bukowski's our DP and basically in the camera work, it had to move with the speed of Didion's prose. So she speaks in these long sentences sometimes, these very clip sentences. And so that to me said steady cam. So you'll see in the opening of film a lot of continuous steady cam shots that are like run on like breathless kind of like, you know, takes. And so, um, that informed it. We had a great state of cam operator, Stu Cantrell, who had like this thing on his back for like 90% of the time. So that was it, because I wanted to have this like relentless fluidity and like almost be faster than you can think. Um, so that was steady cam. And then um, in terms of like the overall look of it, we wanted it, even though it was set in the 80s, we wanted it to have the look of like a 70s kind of like paranoia film. And so um, Bobby Bukowski like, had these old Kodak, Kodachrome references that where the greens are a little more yellow, the blacks are never quite black, so the blacks are always brown. So everything gets a kind of like muddier, warmer kind of texture. And um, in terms the effect of that for the it just feels um, it feels it feels a little intense, like it feels a little heated. Everything is like there's no respite, you know, in the palette really. And then um, and even like the aspect ratio, we chose a squarer picture so that you get the feeling of like you know we're not something's just outside the frame. You're not seeing the whole picture because like widescreen would show you too much. And so by using a small aspect ratio, you know you feel like Elena, this kind of like you know limited vision. And um, also like in the lens choice, so we shot, it was like the, so the, the camera we used was the Alexa LF, and we shot it with um, these like lenses from the 70s. Oh, wow. And so it's like old glass on this very, very new thing. And then it just makes you feel like it's of the place, not like it's just like a veneer slapped on top of it. Sure. So um, yeah. Is there a favorite scene that you enjoyed working on? I mean, I love the Madison Bar scene. So that's where um, we first meet Dick, and so uh, and Elena's talking to her dad, Dick. And I like it because it's like it's expositional, but it's like super dramatic, and you see the tension of their relationship. So I love that. And I have to mention Ann Crabtree, a costume designer. Like in the palette, we re we uh, did a lot of tone on tone, so re to recreate that warmth. So it's like burgundy against red against orange, and in her palette, like Elena's like a sparrow. She's like brown. She's like burnt orange, and so just like creating that, you know, warmth throughout, like in the costume and Inbal Weinberg was our production designer. In the production design, like the browns on browns, you know, helped kind of serve that whole kind of idea. Yeah. Um, what do you think the film is able to convey that you wouldn't necessarily get from the text itself? I think the film is able to convey that you can get from the text itself that we're often blind to who our real heroes are, you know? And um, it's, it's, 
yeah, I would say, say that. More, say more about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if I'll give it away, but I'll just say, like, you it's know. A, people should have read it. It's a novel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just that you can be blind to who the real heroes are. And, and, and it's kind of, I guess, a dark take, but it's kind of like the idea that, like, the machine rolls on, you know, like, the United States rolls on, like, even when you try to stop it, you can't stop it. So it's kind of a downer, but I mean, I don't know, it's cool. <laughs> um, so what do you think, so I wanted to s sort of pivot to um, your working relationship with Netflix. What do you think um, is the benefit of working with this kind of sort of production and, and having this level of, um, of distribution? How is it different from, from a, a traditional model? Yeah, so this is different from Mudbound in that. So with Mudbound, that was independently produced, and then Netflix bought it at Sundance. And then with this film, we started with independent financiers, then they got scared of the budget and dropped out. And we took this to every other studio, and yet again, every other studio's like, it's Joan Diddy and it's me. Like, yes, right. yes, and they're like, no. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> and so then Netflix came in with their red cape and saved it, and they're like, okay, you know, we'll make this film. And so for me, it's about getting to like do a script, getting to adapt a book that, you know, other, you know, studios were shying from because they were kind of like, how is this going to be a story? So, I mean, and the benefit of them is that they're super hands-off. Like, the, the good thing is that they're hands-off. The bad thing is that they're way hands-off. So it's like, hey, is like, somebody going to check on me? Is somebody going to like, you know, <laughs> like, have, have, like, have they watched it? So, I mean, so, I mean, but I, I'll, I'll take the freedom over like the hovering any day. So that, that's yeah. to me the benefit of it, yeah. Um, I have one more question before we open it up to audience Q&A, so just think about what you want to ask Dee. Um, what do you think is the benefit of, of showing at, at Sundance? It's not something you have to do, um, but, but you, you, know, you come all the time. And so t talk about your experience and your relationship with, with Sundance and why you think it's important to sort of li liaise with, the, with the, um, the viewer this way. Yeah, so for me, I think I probably have like a sentimental attachment to Sundance because like Pariah premiered here and like before Pariah, like I workshopped the film here and so it was like my first kind of like, um, I don't know, encouragement as a filmmaker. It was the first kind of external kind of like, you can do this, you know, and like I, when I came to the industry, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any producers. I had zero relationships in these studios and so Netflix kind of became that gatekeeper for me and so um, it's a way of kind of like, connecting with audiences and keeping it going. And so keeping audiences like excited about new filmmakers and new work. And so by coming back, I hope it just inspires people to say, okay, good independent film is out there. Like look for it. We don't have to just watch the commercial stuff. Right. And so it's important to just, I think audiences are smart and audiences are hungry. And so for me, this is like the first like live connection I have with like audiences. And cause even, you know, for Pariah, which, you know, got a small theatrical release, like after the festival, you don't see how people react because you don't, you know, you don't sit through it. So the festival is like one of the few times you get to see how people. Is that nerve wracking? Yes, <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. I like, I like tremble during Mudbound. I yeah. tremble during Pride. So it's like, I watch it the one time and tremble through it, and then I'm over it. But it's out in the world. And yeah, and then I never watch it again. Like that's it. But I think it's just important to just be in the room and, you know, you kind of get the vibe. So. Um, do we have any questions for D? We have a microphone, so. Um, so I'm just really curious, as um, a film student in her last year at NYU and similar to the path that you um, had taken on, I wanted to know what exactly did you learn from film school and what did you have to learn in the process of just making it and being out there? Because sometimes I feel supported and that I have resources, mm -hmm. and other times I kind of feel like I'm alone or I'm just doing my own thing, and it's a very mm -hmm. hard thing to kind of grapple with. Totally, yeah, no, I relate. I mean, I got, from film school, I got the technical aspects. Like, I learned, like, composition. I learned about every single thing in that frame needs to be deliberate. You know, there's, like, a why. Like, there's not just a vase. There's a vase because, you know, and, like, the vase is at the edge or the vase is at the center or the vase is, like, laying down because. So I think I got, like, the technical competency from NYU. But in terms of, like, emotional support and, like, encouragement, I had to get that from outside the program. Because, like, within the program, it was, like, you're not going to make it. Why are you here? Like... <laughs> No exaggeration, like my first day, you know, the little mixture you go to, like with the dean. So uh, the, our mixture, like the dean at the time, I was like, oh, I'm so happy, dean, to be here. Thanks for accepting me. And she's like, oh, you're black. Of course you're here, you know. And so basically told me in front of other students that I was an affirmative action, you know, um, you know, student, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so after that, I was like, okay, fuck it. You might have brought me in for the wrong reason, but, you know, you're going to, you know, be proud for the right ones, you know. So that's, I have a complicated relationship with film school, but... Um, yeah, <laughs> but I think you have to like, you know, find like your money, find your funding, like the, 
heard the people who helped me make Pariah weren't at NYU. It was like Nikisa Cooper, who I'd worked with at Colgate Palmolive. It was Bradford Young, who was like this DP from Howard. So it's like you find your crew outside of the program, you know, and like just roll with people who roll with you and ignore the ones who don't and just keep, d you know, and you know, that's it. And I maxed out a lot of credit cards early on, so <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyone else? I really appreciate your voice and your perspective and your storytelling. What found I found very, I just found it a beautiful movie and beautifully executed. Um, I, uh, you talked a little bit about dealing with actors and dealing with them in terms of relationships, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that and how you approach dealing with the actors based off of those relationships. Yeah, so I think for like any scene, I just always try to think about, it's, it's like not about this, it's not about the little thing they're talking about. And so it's just kind of for each character, you're kind of figuring out like what does each person like really want? Like even if it's not something that ever gets said, so if you go into like one person like wants an apology, it's like for the Madison bar, it's like Elena like wants an apology, you know? And like dad wants to like be forgiven, you know? And so then if you take that approach to it, you know, you can kind of make things uncomfortable, like with how you sit, sit them next to each other or you, you sit them far from each other. So you just kind of give actors that kind of intention. And then I find that that kind of like gives subtext and kind of infuses the conversation with a little edge. And I think like you'll start to see if something's not working. And I've learned like if you're repeating yourself to an actor, you're not saying the right thing because so it's like if you say apologize and that doesn't work like use a different verb you know because obviously apologize means something different to them so it's like the, it's like you're like watching like the translation and so you're saying okay when I say that that makes you do this and you, you're looking at the body language that you want and so I've, I've just learned like don't repeat yourself don't just say no be apologetic don't just say the same thing a different way you got to then figure out the language that like you know um, gets to them. You could, it might be like, defend this placemat, you know, or, or, and then that'll make them do this. So it's kind of like, you kind of learn with your actors what language moves them. Some actors are super physical. Some actors work really like emotionally. And some, y it's like you just kind of have to find the thing. Or sometimes I'll just talk to one actor, not the other, and give them some piece of information that has nothing like to like do with the script. And so just they have that in their eyes or they have that in their thoughts as they are dealing like with this other thing. And, um, you know, even you just get them in a, like like on Mudbound, for example, like Jonathan Banks, I love him. He was like, you know, I'm not going to do these exercises. I know what you're doing. I'm not going to do it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was him and Garrett Hedlund. I was like, yeah, yeah, but just, you know, tell him you love him. He's like, nope, 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 not going to do it, not going to do it. But I was like, you know, I had him, Garrett, Jason Clark, and just had them in the triangle. And then over the course, like, broke it down. He's like, God damn it, D. You know, and he's like, okay, I love you, son. You know, and it's like, even though he, like, never says that in the entire movie or entire script, like, that thing between them. Because at the end of the day, like, those sons want their father to love them, you know, and he wants the same thing from them, but they go about alienating each other, you know? And so it's just kind of figuring out what the characters want that's underneath what they're saying. And, like, if something isn't working, try different verbs. And if, that, if it's not that, I, I don't know, try to adjust the blocking last, because I'm assuming you've composed it very specifically for a reason. So, but it's maybe giving them, like, an end to that, you know? So, I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions? Here's one in the front. Hi, um, I have a question as far as the DP working with Rachel. How was that experience? How did you meet her? And like, did you feel any different working with a female DP? Um, and you know, did in any way, how was the feeling different? It wasn't different. I don't believe in this male female DP hold the camera differently thing. I don't. I think it's about like connection to material. And so I think you should choose a DP based on the on on the subject. And so based on who has a connection with the material. So for this one, I wanted Bobby Bukowski because this was like, I wanted this like 70s vibe and he's like from 70s New York, you know? So I knew we'd have a certain like sensibility about it. He grew up on like Panic and Noodle Park and like all those kind of things that would like kind of inform the thing. And with Rachel from Mudbound is very kind of like portraiture, you know? And I knew that she's like, you know, interested in that. And so I came to meet her through um, Lynn Amato at HBO. So I'd done Bessie there. And I think she had done confirmation with Rick Famuyiwa. And so um, Lynn knows us both, and was like, I think you'd like Rachel, you should hook up with her. And so it was on Lynn Amato's recommendation. I was like, okay, let's you know, check her out for like Mudbound. And um, it's that, so it's kind of like, I think you choose a DP based on what you're shooting, almost, you know? Because you, you get, I mean, you have to be careful because everybody like has their thing, you know? And so you wanna make sure they're not just doing their usual thing. 
on your story. You know, they have to do their thing. They, they, ha they have to adjust to the story. They have to adjust to the character. They can't just do their thing they do, you know? So, yeah. Oh, here's one. Yeah, one of the things I really love about your film is the uh, use of color. So I like to uh, hear about how, how you get uh, inspiration to uh, assign the color palette for the film and also color palette for each character. Yeah, yeah. So for this one, Ann Crabtree's our costume designer who did Handmaid's Tale. And she's just like smart and amazing and plays with like funky shapes. But um, so for this, it's like figuring out each who, who each character is. So like Treat Morrison, he's true blue. So his palette is like red, white, and blue. You know? It's like literal, but it's like navies, it's blues. You want He's like the coolest character in the story. Like literally just like physically like cool, like, you know, in temperature, not affect. And then um, for Elena, she was like a sparrow. And in a way, kind of like Alike um, in Pariah, like Alike's progression was from like uh, drabs, monotones to color throughout the film. But in this film, Anne stays more kind of like browns and then she becomes like pastel. And that's the idea of kind of like armoring and layering. And she has breast cancer or, fin or battled breast cancer. And so part of her palette design was about armor and hiding and layering and that kind of thing informed it. Um, so like rusts, browns. Um, uh, Alma was like an artist, so her palette needed to be, be more prints, you know, like less solids. So she's printed. She's also layered, but in like, so it, she kind of has this like bohemian feel. And so, you know, and then we knew that the filter or the thing that were, the look they were setting for the film already had like a brown tint to it. So then we had to be careful because then that tint would like send everything off. And tint is not the right word, but like the uh, LUT. So we knew we had a super kind of like warmish, brownish LUT. And so then you're remembering like what's on the camera versus what's on the wardrobe and just trying to make sure you still get like separation. So it's just like the individual character palettes are based on who they are and you're trying to like personify that. And like Dick was just like suave, cool. So it was like burgundies. It was like kind of like royal colors, you know. And then when he's sick, you know, then he's like vulnerable. So he's like in lighter things. He's like in more fragile looking colors. So you kind of figure out each character's arc and their clothes palette can have an arc. And you think about the production design of it. And the production designer is talking to the costume designer. You guys are all meeting together. So they know that this sweater is going to show up in front of this wall. And is that going to be OK? You know, so like you just kind of think about all that kind of stuff and think about progressions and where you want characters to go. And there's a lot of scenes where characters are like matching each other, you know? So it's this cool thing where it's like Elena and Trudor are matching. It's like, oh, they're on the same team. They're wearing like baby blue together, you know? And then the same thing with like Barry Sedlow. So it's like I did this thing where like Elena is often matching, you know, who she's in the scene with. So it's this kind of cool um, sparrow hiding chameleon thing going on. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. I saw a gentleman over here. really just love your work and have been following you since since Pariah. And I just had a question. I'm a filmmaker named Huel Case, and I just had a uh, question about your relationship to light. And that's really something that uh, I've just been fascinated about, your relationship to light I in, in cinema, if you could talk about <laughs> that. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I think everything serves like the character of the story, you know? So for example, in Pariah, Alike, the whole, each character had kind of like an animal kind of like spirit. And so Alike like was a chameleon. So she was always painted by whatever's around her. So she's, she was pink, she was blue, she was purple, she was green. And then toward the end of the movie, she's in white light, you know? So it's like the lighting should serve the characterizations and, and the storytelling. Um, with um, this particular film, it, it needed, or like uh, with like Mudbound, it needed to feel like very like natural. Like we shot an actual sharecropper's cabin. So the light, you know, we had to like cut Rachel had to cut like a hole like in the roof to get a light like above because there's no way, but it's a lot of like stuff coming from like, the sides because like that's where the light is coming from. So and it's super kind of like um, because it's like them against nature. It had to have this kind of like not harsh, but it had to f have the, like a matter of fact kind of feel, you know. And then with this film, um, it's a lot of like a lot of like warmish lights, a lot of like. Um, still just wanting it to feel like environmental and like I like characters to walk in and out of you know light and not constantly be like fully lit so for me I probably tend to like I'd, I'd rather err on the side of like under lighting than to like over light and you know let you know let you like look for them a little bit and so like my favorite sequence like with that in this film was Elena goes to her dad's house and realizes the state he's in and so it's this whole like shadowy thing and the, even like the, the note for production design was like it's dark even like when it's day in here, you know. So she goes in to this interior 
and it's still, even like the light feels like brownish and it feels very kind of like um, dirtied and filtered. So I think the lighting should serve the characters and like the lighting is like the DP, you know, like let them do it, but you just kind of talk about the feeling you want, but let the DP do their thing, you know, but you just have the kind of character ideas about it, yeah. Well, that concludes our talk. Please join me in thanking Dee Reese for being with us today.